You are listening to Creativity in Healthcare, hosted by Dr. Matthew J. Taylor, editor of the textbook Fostering Creativity in Rehabilitation. In this podcast, we explore the science and processes that enhance your own creativity and that of your related healthcare organizations. True healthcare reform hasn't happened yet, but working together, let's explore how we can nurture the next new evolution in healthcare delivery. Creativity in Healthcare. I'm your host, Matt Taylor. Today, I have the privilege of exploring creativity in healthcare through the experiences and expertise of Cynthia Cooper, who has an MFA and MA. She's a licensed registered occupational therapist and a certified hand therapist. Cynthia is the owner of Cooper Hand Therapy here in Scottsdale, Arizona, as well as adjunct faculty in the occupational therapy department of A.T. Still University in Mesa, Arizona. She's not just a hand therapist with 36 years of experience, but has twice edited Mosby's Fundamentals of Hand Therapy and is a sought-after international presenter at hand therapy conferences. She throws herself full force into any project she's committed to, to include research on therapeutic interventions for chemotoxicity. Presently, she's preparing to create yet another chapter in her creative life as she and her husband, John, prepare to move to the Southern California coast. As with all our episodes, you'll be able to find our show notes, Cynthia's CV, and links at www.healthcarecreativity.com. Welcome to the show, Cynthia. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, good. We're going to have fun. Um, So in addition to what I've already shared with our audience, Cynthia, uh, you also have that MFA in your, your suffix alphabet string there, which is what most people relate to creativity as being kind of arty. Um, you and I both know it's more than that, but I'm wondering if you just take a couple minutes and share with our listeners kind of your journey from that arts background into your occupational therapy and how that's influenced uh, your creative roles in occupational therapy. Sure. Uh, I was uh, very interested in fine arts from uh, my childhood, and I went to college uh, and started with a bachelor's in fine arts with an emphasis in painting. So it was studio arts. Mm -hmm. And I continued for my master's in fine arts uh, in uh, studio painting. And as I was completing that degree, um, I began to recognize that many of the extremely creative people around me um, including myself, were going to be challenged in the job market. Uh, so reality was hitting about my uh, uh, opportunities to sustain myself financially. But the other issue for me was that I became a little bit cynical about whether or not it was healthy for me to stay uh closed up in my studio identity my my expression and my process in art was very private uh and i found that i had lost my connection to other people and i felt that the continued emphasis just in my self exploration as an artist might not be broad enough for my social needs and might even be unhealthy. And that's a whole other area we could talk about if you want to. Okay. But yeah, it's fascinating that that you had that sense, that felt sense that this isn't a a good fit, right? I mean, it's not going to be complete, right? It's not going to be complete. And I felt that to some extent to really be the ultimate creative person there is a fine line where you may it may be very easy to romanticize the lifestyle of an ultra creative person but it may not always be the healthiest choice yeah for myself i've decided that it would be interesting to explore how i could um kind of transition into another profession where hopefully i could draw on some of the creativity eventually 
So I started to explore uh, uh, allied health and rehabilitation fields, and I was drawn especially to occupational therapy. But uh, in those days, and this would have been in the mid to late 1970s, uh, there was a lot more support for mental health uh, rehabilitation. And there were many more roles for occupational therapists in the mental health sector than there are now. My interests in occupational therapy began with an interest in uh, uh, mental health rehabilitation. So I applied uh, to occupational therapy school, and in those days, there were six programs that welcomed people with a degree from another field, and uh, I think in those days, they called it the basic master's, but you would go through a curriculum and wind up with a master's degree in occupational therapy. Now there are tons of those programs, but in my day, there were only six in the whole nation. (laughs) So I went to occupational therapy school at University of Southern California, which was a very fine curriculum uh, and very unique. Um, And I was identified early on by the professors as a person who would maybe have to work harder at the basic science part of the curriculum, <laughs> but they all assured me, and they, they recognized that because I, I asked questions that let them know I was approaching this from a very conceptual point of view and real concrete uh, uh, rote pieces of learning weren't my forte, right. but synthesizing and being conceptual were. Yeah. They recognized that and they assured me that I would excel in their second year and I had to struggle through the first year a little bit to to get to the second year. Sure. Um, So that was a a curriculum that emphasized, eventually emphasized more creative thinking than concrete technical skills and they made the assumption and they told us that we would need to keep learning our concrete clinical skills on our own and in our uh, job choices, but that we would be strong in the thinking and thinking outside the box piece of therapy. So that held out to be true for me, but I uh, started my um, occupational therapy career at Rancho Los Amigos, uh, which is now called Rancho Los Amigos National Rehabilitation Hospital in the Los Angeles area. And that was a training facility and that helped flesh out some of the clinical areas that I needed to become stronger in. So as for tapping into the MFA piece of my history, I never ever felt like I really fit into a traditional uh, department mentality. Right. (laughs) I was the kind of person that was always a little bit marginal and that was, I think I embraced that and chose to be that way. It does, it's not necessarily good for um, uh, a traditional career and promotional path, but it, right. is, it, was, it was more true to myself that way. Yeah. And it's taken me in many years, but over time I started to recognize and even embrace the times where I was recognizing that my truth about how to treat patients was different from a lot of the people in a department I'd be working within. Uh-huh. That was difficult and painful some of the times. But it led me to finally understanding that I was very lucky to be able to have a different voice. And I wound up being multiple times in different departments. I wound up being the person that would be sent the challenging patients. Okay. (laughs) Non-compliant patients. Right. Uh And I recognize that as uh, a compliment to my skill set. And um, more recently, what some of my referring doctors say is that they'll tell their patients something like this. I don't know exactly what she does but you really need to go see her. (laughs) (laughs) That's a familiar mantra that I've heard before. Yeah, (laughs) that's wonderful. I'm wondering, um, you know, so as our listeners are are, um, reflecting on this for themselves, you know, that discomfort that you talked about, the, the not quite fitting and also the, gee, I'm not on the promotional path to be the director or whatever, you know, those kind of things. Um, 
do, do you have, did you have at the time a particular way you dealt with that? Did you just reflect when you were exercising or did you meditate or did you, or, or was that just kind of in the thread of your, your general life and it showed up? It was, you know, was there any, and for, for the non-technique, the conceptual person, was there a technique that, that helped you clarify, you know, those, through those discomforts? Right? Yeah. Um, yes, some of the things that were helpful to me included finding like-minded souls and uh, discussing mm. uh, so that I could better understand where I wasn't quote unquote fitting and and through those conversations I began to really appreciate this as an advantage. Um, the, that's one thing. The second thing that I did and have um, pursued for many, many years is to intentionally become what I would think of as a, uh, a productive irritant to my colleagues. Okay, that's um, great. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, on purpose, and this was the fine arts piece of me, right? <laughs> <laughs> the rebel and the marginal piece. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, and and this uh, manifests in um, primarily in looking for themes and to topics to write and present on, to write about and present on that were typical, non-traditional, hopefully provocative. Right. And that's how I continue to find my identity uh, as a healthcare provider, I think. Yeah. Uh, and, and it seems it would take some courage, though, to be the provocateur. I mean, it, it doesn't sound like you're, well, I guess, depends on how your stereotype of the arts, but I guess in, in, in the real art world, it is the person that can evoke the, the, the response from their, their audience or their... Yes. Right. And so, so to some degree, that was a little bit of that attitude you're saying, or definitely. Um, early on, uh, when I began to do some speaking, um, I recognized what a friend of mine has um, uh, termed uh, ego predators, and it's not uncommon in my experience to have people in the audience who are there with the goal of um, taking the wind out of your sails, yeah. criticizing, um, not necessarily listening, not necessarily putting forth a productive dialogue right. where differences of opinion could be exchanged. Right. So um, I have come to terms with ego predators. And as I came to terms with that, I experienced less of it, which is a good thing. But I can still remember uh, some very um, uh, controversial moments where there'd be a meeting, you present your material, and then uh, an expert with an agenda would get up and negate your work uh, in front of hundreds of people. Sure. And so, and the worst ones of those experiences for me was in two, the year 2000. And I have never presented since then without remembering that. Uh -huh. um, and when that happened, I felt like I had two choices. One is to just be quiet from here on in or to just keep talking. <laughs> and so I wound up, I kept talking and I kept writing. Yeah. And what was the controversial topic or what was the, do you remember? Actually, yes. And the funny thing is, this is one of my most quote unquote traditional textbook topics. Oh, that no. <laughs> but it was about um, some of the biomechanical features of the extensor digitorum in the hand. Yeah. And there were people in the audience who were attached to being considered experts in the field. And I was proposing something based on good research that was challenging for them. Oh, okay. So it wasn't some far mm -hmm. out esoteric little practice. You were talking basic biomechanical. I was, yeah. yeah. And, and it was fun. about dynamic stabilization, which has become much more appreciated um, maybe in my field in the last 15 years than it was Prior. At that time, okay. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what, what were some of your other edgy things that you were 
provoking with. Do you remember any of the topics that would have been a little bit yes. crazy? <laughs> um, I, I've done a lot of talking and speaking about uh, the, the perception of a challenging or non-compliant patient. Okay. So I've, um, uh, some of the, I don't know if this was edgy, but it, did, it struck chords, but it was um, surprisingly too new for my colleagues. They should have known this stuff. Uh, but <laughs> the field that I've uh, described as symbolic issues, uh, and ultimately this is about narrative medicine and storytelling. Right. About the patient's story. And and this is this is what I think is probably not taught well enough in uh, the um, basic curricula, at least in my field. And and so that's the ability to help the patient evoke their story or to work as editor with their story, it's both? Uh, both, and to, um, and to even, for starters, recognize and appreciate the importance of the story. The story. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, and, I mean, obviously, writing a story would be something people would think of as then creative, but... I, I guess there's non-creative stories people use in their in their health. Is that is that yes. Mean? yes? And if we don't know anything about them as human beings, we're really not going to meet their needs. Right. Uh, so um, if uh, so, here's my uh, here's an example for me. I've worked in departments where there were extremely capable therapists who could spit off the tip of their tongue every technical um, and anatomical um, feature of the diagnosis the patient is presented with. Right. And this is somebody who could definitely treat the diagnosis with their eyes closed, but they would, I'm sure, not be treating the person. Right. They wouldn't be treating their illness experience. So I'm interested in things like that. Um, and so I've said to my colleagues and students, if I was a patient, I would rather have an inexperienced therapist who was willing to go learn about what they needed to know to, to treat my anatomical phenomena, right. but have it be a person who demonstrated compassion and caring. And I worked in departments where therapists were so expert, but had no interest in connecting with their patient as a human being, sure. and I would say, hands down, in my mind, that's not rehabilitation. Or that's where rehabilitation needs to be rehabilitated. Yes, the rehab, rehab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's a term we like to use. Um, so, you know, you're, you're at that phase, you've found yourself out there. I, when Folks, when you look at her CV, she's got three arms length worth of presentations over a couple of decades <laughs> and some wonderful topics that you've, you've uh, instructed in. But um, at that point, then it starts moving you in different clinical settings. You, did you have a series of experiences and beyond that? And, and then what brought you to your private practice today? What, uh, good, good question. I, I have worked in all kinds of environments ranging from physician owned um, uh, hand therapy practices affiliated with hand surgeons. Years ago, I worked in large rehabilitation um, hospital outpatient types of environments. Um, I've um, worked um, a, as an employee in private practices. Um, and um, I wound up always realizing that I would do better if I could have as much time as I wanted with the patient right. and if I could get rid of some of the productivity demands that have really impacted the ability, for, at least for me, to enjoy my work and feel that my work was meaningful. And I know a lot of therapists who are just putting in their nine to five and they are so burned out and they are not 
enriched or en energized by their work. Right. And I recognized that it was time, um, as I was nearing the time where I would be thinking about retirement, I recognized that I needed um, an opportunity to really have all the independence that I could possibly have. So I um, was fortunate enough to be able to set myself up as an independent contractor inside a physical therapy company, a very good, reputable, and ethical physical therapy company. Um, and in that company, um, I've, I am an independent contractor, and I created my own caseload for my quote unquote hand therapy patients. Right. And <laughs> Those I, hands uh, that walked into your clinic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and at that time I, um, by, by the time I was ready to do that, I had a small handful of physicians who I knew would refer to me uh, in that capacity. Right. Um, I, Matt, I should add one of the um, themes that I have been passionate about that might've been another marginal issue that has shaped who, how I identify myself um, is that while hand therapy is a very interesting aspect of rehabilitation, I've always been concerned that um, there's so much more to treating a person than just knowing their biomechanical and, uh, and tissue specific issues of their problem. Those are important features, but I've always come from the perspective that it's a whole person. And, uh, and in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, I was um, on the board at AOTA in a capacity where I was um, um, working with the things that, it, since 90% of, of certified hand therapists are occupational therapists, um, what can we do to maximize their ability to drop their occupational therapy identity as their performing hand therapy. It's very, because mm. hand therapy is technically a hybrid of PT and OT. Sure. It has its own scope of practice and it can draw people who are very reductionistic and biomechanical in their approach. And it, I think it's self-selecting. It draws people who are comfortable there. Right. And many hand therapists forego their affiliation with their parent organization Many are not, yeah, many don't belong to AOTA anymore, and many do not keep their registration as occupational therapists. So they get the credential OT, not OTR. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And yes, and symbolically, it's very powerful, very important because our hand therapy organizations are very small. And our AOTA parent organization is much larger and has more of a voice uh, in issues related to our reimbursements and our survival as a profession. Right. Sure. So, so hand therapy tends to draw people who may be very comfortable practicing in a reductionistic way. Right. And so themes that, that have been really important to me have included um, uh, the importance and strategies how to, even in 15 minutes, be more than reductionistic. Right. Exactly. And, and what do you hear back from clients that maybe have had another hand therapy experience or um, it's their first or whatever? What, what kind of feedback as an artist, yeah, scientist, because we're going to talk about your research in a second, what kind of feedback do you get that's, that reinforces or validates that approach? What, what do you hear? Tremendous amount of feedback. Um, many of them will tell me that this is unlike any rehab experience they've had and it's what's been missing. Right. Um, many will come in complaining about the um, perception of a shake and bake where it wasn't even a licensed professional treating them. Right. I had one patient tell me that a high school student was, ring, was doing uh, her hands-on therapy. Yikes. <laughs> a practice. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Yes. <laughs> I'm not unheard of. <laughs> no. um, and um, when a patient doesn't unnecessarily identify this, I take a moment usually to make sure they understand the difference uh, of what I'm doing and what they would tend to get 
most places out in the community. So I explained to them how unique it is to have one hour, one-on-one -on -one with me as a licensed professional. Right. And I explained to them that they're going to very likely have fewer visits, less expense, more emphasis on them learning to be their own best therapist. Right. So you and, empower them. There's an yes. empowerment to the client, right? And I try to give give them that information, and, and um, they, the, particularly the ones who recognize the difference, are very articulate with their physicians because I hear back from the physicians. Okay. So, so um, they, and the other thing I do is I start the visit with giving them my contact info, including my cell phone and my email, and tell them the more we communicate, the better patients who ask the most questions have the best outcomes. Wow. And this is the opposite of what they're hearing in their healthcare in general. Sure. Um, the rest of their, um, mm. how the rest of their needs are being met or not met. And, um, and then I communicate a lot with their physicians. Um, okay. so, so communication is a very big piece of this. Um, and, um, and I think they're usually surprised by how accessible I want them to, um, to they, I want them to see that I'm very accessible. Right. And uh, I think that that really changes the feeling between us quite immediately. Sure. Yeah. That's a, and the same. I do the same thing. It's like, you're not bugging me. Here's my numbers. Here's my address. Call me in the middle of the night. I won't answer, but otherwise, <laughs> you know, it's, that does make a big difference. And then it completes that business feedback loop through the referral source as you communicate, right? Exactly. And I would say that I feel like I'm dancing between two extremes in a typical interaction with a patient because I'm, but most of all, I really want to understand what who they are and what they need, but I'm always filtering it through the um, um, more traditional, typical textbook material that's become um, intuitive for me now over the years. And I, um, I, I'm never ignoring that. Um, if they're gesturing and we're talking, I'm always still looking at the way in which they're using their body okay. and what's their posture and how, what does their breathing look like? Sure. Um, but I, it's, so I get to meet these marvelous people and hear their complex stories about their lives. And the thing is, when you make it make space, they'll say things that are, uh, that they'll even say back to me. I don't even know why I'm telling you about this. Is that right? But then I know we're really in the right place. Right. Right. Um, or we'll have a quiet moment and be doing some exercise and a person might get tearful and say, I lost my spouse last year and I really miss him. So these are the moments that aren't taught in curricula. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, it's such a factory productivity efficiency model. It is. In fact, yeah, that's, uh, you know, yeah. the, the yogis like to say the, the hands do the heart's work. Oh, it's and so, so You know, and so if, 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 if there's no space for the person to share their heart, how, how do you, how do you fix their hands? Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's beautiful. Wow. Well, well, sometimes I'll have patients who are coming in insisting that if the therapy doesn't, uh, okay. So I'm going to back up and say that I'm a really big, um, proponent of everything we do that if it's going to be therapeutic, it has to be pain free. And many patients love hearing this, but some actually will argue that with me. Really? <laughs> and once in a blue moon, they will make it clear that if they can't have something that hurts, then they will feel that their time has been wasted with me. Holy and if I God. can't change that part of their story, we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but there have been times when a patient makes it perfectly clear that they, they're not going to perceive that they're injuring themselves, although I perceive painful therapy as, as injury to tissue. Sure. Mm -hmm. But if I can't, once in a blue moon, if I can't convince somebody of that, then I might have to meet them halfway. Right. Give them a little little overstretch, but not yeah. damaging, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> but um, these are the interesting kind of some of the recurrent themes and, uh, and, and interesting conversations. There are certain conversations that you have repeatedly, and it's because people are indoctrinated into certain beliefs. Uh, often because of traditional rehabilitation. 
Right. And, and even larger societal issues around self-care and yes. others first and yes. a lot of those models, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, what I, what I really love about your background and your, and the way you, you care for people is that we've got this amazing humanistic compassionate approach and yet you've edited you know the textbook on fundamentals of hand therapy and and i was privileged in the last edition to have a chapter so i know what a guiding and qualified hand at editing you have and so going through all those chapters sure enough you do have that literal <laughs> volume of you know the, the technical work and expertise of your other contributors in that um but then maybe it, the thing you wouldn't expect to hear is, oh, you're involved in research. So can you share with the listeners that, you know, here's this MFA or uh, what was it? The productive irritant. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you just got a research study funded. So yeah. spend a minute or two about where research then fits in your creative capacity, what, why that's important to you. Okay. Um, I think I have to go back to my um, academic experience oh so many years ago at USC and in, in our uh, coursework people individually had to do a master's thesis very traditional um, and quantitative research okay. soon after that, that program embraced qualitative more and more of their output for theses were qualitative research designs and I my timing was off because I'm at heart so drawn to qualitative. Sure. Okay, so um, so I've always had a very strong respect for um, the the research process and a healthy amount of cynicism. Um, right. <laughs> but um, uh, in one of my longer job stints, I was. Uh, is it fine to name facilities, Matt? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. So I was at, at Mayo um, and um, for almost eight years and as a hand therapy team lead and a clinical research coordinator. And I was very interested in movement disorders always, way back. I've been interested in particularly in tremor. And my particular interest has always been in essential tremor, which is very underlooked. Uh, you know, overlooked and underappreciated. So long story short, I got an opportunity to collaborate with some neurologists at Mayo, and we wound up with eventually two funded research projects related to tremor. Um, and um, that was um, back in uh, the 90s. Um, and, um, uh, and that uh, process and experience going through the institutional review board that wasn't uh, university-based, you know, more of a uh, healthcare system process and uh, uh, being funded were really important experiences and opportunities for me. Um, and continuing to always have an interest in research, subsequently there were other studies that I uh, uh, wrote um, but left, um, left that job before the study was implemented. So I've had uh, I have some track record in the daunting task of submitting a proposal um, to an institutional review board. And I greatly appreciate the vulnerability and the ego, <laughs> um, uh, the ego uh, trauma, <laughs> <laughs> rejections and criti criticisms. Sure. Uh, but... Um, about four or five years ago, well, about seven years ago, I became very interested in the notion that people coming from um, the knowledge base of hand therapy had something to offer patients who were experiencing chemotherapy-related peripheral neuropathy. And it took me a long time to generate some referrals, and now that's a substantial part of my caseload. And along the way, I um, started to collaborate with some res uh, researchers in clinical trials at Virginia Piper in Scottsdale. Right. And we have, uh, we wrote and have been working through a, a research proposal, which uh, it's been about three or four years now since that was actually started, but it is now funded and hopefully yeah. soon will um, be opened. And so 
this is an area I'm extremely interested in. It's an area in which there is no research. It's ground, it's, you know, we're working from the ground up here. I hope to light the fire of interests among other occupational therapists, physical therapists, rehab professionals, to the un, yet unmet needs of people who are on chemotherapy with neuropathy, for which the traditional literature says there is not so much that can help. Right. We're seeing some really powerful, dramatic responses that are still only anecdotal, but it's been so powerful that the physicians are now sending us people preventatively before they start the chemotherapy agents known to cause neuropathy. That's amazing. <laughs> yes, and our study, which originally was going to be an intervention study, methodologically has gone through many transformations, but it is, it is now a prevention study. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So there's a lot of ways that we in rehab can work with this population, and there are many, many re approachable clinical and research questions that, that have yet to be explored. So I hope in the future to be able to continue that conversation with people who would be interested in this. And I'm starting to create some relationships and network with uh, facilities where there would be departments that could support this kind of endeavor. Um, I, do, I do a survey with my occupational therapy students and I ask them if they're interested in uh, cancer rehabilitation. Right. And most of them say uh, that they don't feel they know enough about it. And this is an area where there are chapters in the basic occupational therapy physics textbooks, but there are not necessarily lectures. And there are, there's not a lot of attention paid to this, this, this thing. Yeah, and then we look at the demographics and the exponential growth of that oh. patient base now. It's just, it's almost... Un, you can't can't wrap your hands around how fast it's growing. Can you? That's, that is so true, um, and um, uh, and so that's an area that I've become increasingly interested in, and that's where how I hope to continue to um, um, uh, modify and kind of reform my career path. As Do you have your rehab? <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Um, so I'll be closing my clinical caseload, and, and a colleague of mine will continue that uh, as I plan to relocate to Southern California, and I hope to be more involved in this new area of, of ongoing interest and to continue to participate in the research study. So that's my next chapter. Oh, how exciting. Uh, so I, I would imagine there will be listeners that would want to reach out and connect or ask for guidance in that. What's the best way for our listeners to find you? And I would love to hear from people. I, um, that would please me very much. My email address is Cynthia at cooperhandtherapy.com. Okay. We'll put that in the show notes and I'll also put it over the video overlay too, so that they've, they've got that and it's got a contact page on it or your, um, Oh, that's your email, but your your website's the same. Yes, yes, it's cooperhamptherapy.com. Okay, great. Well, this has been such a pleasure, and it's we've had so much fun so far. You know, we got to present at the the, the hand conference a couple of years ago with the yoga therapy chapter, and uh, just the, now the personal friendship. But but also, I'm excited about what we might collaborate with and. Uh, productively irritate. I call myself a positive deviant. So I think we're oh. going to get along just fine. <laughs> but, but. Yes, I, I agree, Matt. It's been a real pleasure. And your, your book is an extremely important piece uh, that is going to move people in uh, more humanistic directions, I'm sure. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, bon voyage on your travel over to the West Coast and Thank you very much for being here today, Cynthia. Thank you, Matt. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.